In this episode, we're going to break down five ways shippers get tripped up when setting up an API connection with a carrier. To help explain the misconceptions and what you can do to course correct them, I've asked Aborn's Data Integration and Implementation Manager, fun one to say, Bill Muse to join the show. Bill, how's it going? Pretty good. API yeah. Is fun. What? API is always fun. API is a blast, right? So for the folks who are watching, talk a little bit, tell them a little bit about your sort of background with API, how you got started, and what, what you kind of did in the past with API. Um, basically, I'm a computer geek at heart, and I went through most of my life with learning how to build computers, learning a little coding here and there, and that led me into a computer degree. And I, I, I got a job over at Mercury Geek because my brother worked there. He was one of the lead developers. And uh, I learned a lot about the trucking there and how they were combating back and forth. And that was one of the first times I really jumped into the API. And that was basically with the FedEx, UPS, DHL, um, and the other carriers that were actually sending things back and forth. And they had these APIs. And, and I learned that the API is so much faster than the EDI because it's not just sending a file waiting to be picked up. It's not just waiting out there. It's meant to be immediate that as soon as it hits, it picks it up. Um, and so after I did that, after I got into it at Mercury Gate, and it really wasn't my job, but nobody else could really do it. So I, I took it on and, and helped out in them because there was too much to do and not enough people to do it. So I was able to jump in there and actually learn a lot more about it. And now coming over to Aborn, it's helping me with uh, being able to decide between EDI, ABI, um, simple file transfers, going back and forth, things like that. Uh, and what I do here at Aborn is I basically, any data coming in or out, I have to make sure it gets in good, uh, find ways to check it, and make sure that everybody's happy with the end result. And that uh, the less we have to touch stuff, uh, the better everybody's uh, really happy about it. Because one, they don't have to touch it. And two, it's more correct and there's more data integrity in everything that we do. Oh, data integrity is the name of the game for everything. So let's get to it, right? That's why I waste people's time. You, you got your hands, you're elbow deep in everything. You know what you're doing. Let's talk about the five ways shippers get tripped up when setting up an API connection with a carrier. Now, the number one way that you find shippers getting kind of messed up a little bit is there's always multiple connections with an API. What do you mean by that? Well, first of all, every piece of information you want has to come back a little different. Uh, let's take a, a UPS, FedEx, DHL carrier, um, even SIA or one of the other LTL carriers that have an API. When you send them a rate request, it has to look different than whether you, when you want to get a send them the tender to come pick it up. A, when they send you things back saying, hey, we picked it up. Hey, we took this one. Much like EDI, you have different messages in EDI. We, in API, you have to format different parts of it a little differently so that it can understand that this is a status message. It's not a, it's not one of the, um, it's not asking for a rate. It's not asking to pick something up. You got to be able to tell it what it needs to be. Um, and if you go to the FedEx and UPS for their, uh, for their small pack versus their LTL and their truckload, they have actually different companies that do it. So setting up an API with them, you actually have to have different formats for the LTL than you do for the small pack. And there's where you get into multiple connections. I'm sending it here for small pack because it's a different country and I'm sending it here for the LTL or the truckload. It's two different companies that do it, even though the name is still FedEx. So people ask me, can you set up the API with FedEx? And I always have to go, which one? Or, I, you know, can, can you just make the API work? And they think of it as, as a magic push button. You do this and it's all there. But there's always multiple ways you have to send things. I, I think of it much like English, the hardest, worst language in the world. You have British English. You have Australian English. You have U.S. English. You have Redneck English. You have Northeast English. You have Texas, because they're their own thing. We all know. You have right. Texas English, right? It's all the same language. But when you hear them and when you do them, you have to interpret it the way that you are used to. Um, so an API is basically, it stands for application process Pro integration, programming integration. So it's basically a way just to talk to each other. 
Right. I don't even know what it says. It's just API because that means nothing. It's just how they want to talk together. There's no specifications for it. There's no way that there's nothing that says you have to use this language to do it or this type of file or this format. So each time they did it, and especially, I mean, API has only been around for 20 years. It came about early 2000. So you really have no specifications that you have to do it this way for it to work. Everybody has their own. It's a jungle out there in the electronic world. Um, so there's always multiple ways that you have to go and connect and send different data back and forward. It's not just setting up an API and it works. It seems like that because we wrap it all up, us computer geeks, but there's always multiple. So if, if I'm understanding you correctly, when a company touts that they've, they've got standards, they, they've got all this stuff, they don't. There isn't really a standard when it comes to API. It's more like English, like it's the standard of language, which is flexible. Mm -hmm. Very flexible. Oh, that's fascinating because you you always you, you read it. If you're doing any research, you're like, oh, that's what's so great about digital. There's standards in there. Everyone talks this stuff, but it sounds <laughs> like that's where <laughs> yeah, you're laughing at me. You get it. It's not that yeah. simple. No, it's um, not. All right. For, so for the second one, second way people get tripped up is the transfer of information is always a factor. And I think that we have a visual representation. So for those of you who listen to this audio only, you're going to want to go to YouTube and see the visual representation. But Bill, let's pull it up and then walk me through where transfer is being a factor. Okay. As you can see, these are two completely different things up on the screen. The one on your left is the one I prefer the most. It's called XML. One reason I prefer it the most is you can look at it and tell it what it is. This is an address. It's the first word in there. You can tell what it says. It's great. Um, and it's very easy to tell when the address ends because it says forward slash address at the end. So it's easy, nice, compact way to put things in there. XML is a great way for you to use doing your APIs. And the other reason I love XML is there is no boundaries to it. You can make that address type is basically what they call it. It is what they call a tag. You can have any tag you want. You can put anything in there and you can talk back and forth. Very flexible. So many uses for the XML. Extensible markup language means basically it's a free range and you can do anything you want. On the right hand side is the second most, well, it might actually be the most popular these days because it's caught on more with the web APIs and things. It's a JSON script. Now, that sounds really intimidating, JSON. It's basically Java. It's a, you take Java, this big Java language, you narrow it down to the JavaScript, all right? And then they took that JavaScript and said, hey, we're gonna call JSON just this much. And that's what you can do with it. You can do these things with it. Everything about it is, is Java. That's how you program it, that's how it looks, that's how you do when you do JavaScript, it looks almost just like it. It's a lot. It's almost human readable. You can kind of tell what it's doing, but it's not near as, I call it human readable, as the XML on the left-hand side. And the reason I bring this up is because every API can have multiple ways to talk to it. Okay, I think of P44 today. Okay, um, P44 has a brilliant API. We talk to it all the time. We go through MercuryGate, which is a TMS, to talk to P44. So what we do is we go through the software TMS from MercuryGate. It has an integration with the, through API with P44. P44 accepts a, an XML from MercuryGate, converts it to JSON, and then imports it into their system, all in a matter of milliseconds. P44 can accept JSON or XML. Being able to get that data back and forth is relatively easy because B44 has a robust API. When you open up a web page and it says, this web page wants to know your location, lock or allow. That's an API called a Google to, tell where, to figure out where you are. You either block it and say no. That's in another way that it actually talks. It's called HTML. Welcome to web, right? So HTML, I didn't even show it up here because I could show you it'd be just like Greek to everybody else. There's so much overhead in it. There's so, I mean, to say hello world, you have to have a piece of code bigger than I reach my hands on the screen. These, the two I have up here are the most popular ones to use for API calls. Um, 
one, JSON, because there's so many JavaScript programmers out there. XML, because it's so versatile and can do so much more than anything else. So you can kind of look at it. Now, with that said, you have to have somebody, if you're setting up an API, you have to have somebody that can understand what this says, what this means, and what they need to do. The documentation that you get from them for their specifications of their API, everybody's is different. Even EDI, I found out the same thing. The EDI documentations have international standards of EDI. Right. It's so wiggly wobbly that everybody has their own. Yes, you have to stay within these lines, but there's a lot of wiggle room in there. API doesn't even have the international standards of what an API should be. So it is just wild west all over the place. And that's why XML has become so popular with many of our APIs that have more functionality because you can do dang near anything with it. So now getting the data back and forth, you have to create this in a form that you like it so that you can make a call to the API. Not only do you have to format it how you want it, you've got to find a way to get it there. With that being said, there's AS2, there's SF2P, there's SCP, there's a thousand different ways you can get it to it. Anything other than snail mail, UPS, and FedEx, you're great. All of them should work. Now, things happen. Um, I work from home most of the time, and I use Spectrum as my internet provider. Great service when it works. So when that connection is down, guess what? I have no API calls. Okay. I have no way to get that information to them. Okay? I can't queue it up for it to send later. And it doesn't just keep trying. I have to resubmit the API again and again when you lose that difference between the two. So that's why you have trouble with the going back and forth. You have to have a way to transfer the files. You have to have a way to make up the files. You have to understand how they want the files to B before you can get it to them. So yeah, that's one of the things that we really have trouble with when we go to integrate an API with a carrier because everybody has a different specification. Jeez, that sounds, uh, just looking at this sounds intimidating. Like no wonder everyone can get tripped up. All right, we'll stop sharing that and we'll kind of go back into more, more stuff because if we didn't have your eyes sideways beforehand, we're gonna continue. Uh, but the third way, is that documentation never covers all the problems. What do you mean by this? So, you get the documentation, you get the file how you want it to be, and then you're like, well, that's not how I use, that's not how I work. All right, so one of the things that, that I think about here, here at Aborn, we have, we have to have it this way. We have to have it that way. This is how we work. This is how we make sure the carriers are good. This is how we make sure everything gets there on time. Well, the API says that it's going to send it to you. It doesn't tell you that it's going to send it to you in a batch at the end of the day um, for statuses. It doesn't tell you um, if, you're, if you're using XML, this works, but if you're using JSON, this works. So there are different, there are so many different ways. Their documentation you get doesn't always cover what you're looking for. Uh, everything. I mean, you get an instructions because the people who write the instructions are not the people who wrote the code. The people who wrote the instructions are not the people who are installing it, who are configuring it, who are dealing with it day to day. So when you get your instructions, you get your specifications, you have to read between the lines and think. When I use this, is this going to work? You need to leave a lot of time for testing. APIs are not plug and play. We tout them in the digital world as plug and play APIs. Here you go, boom, it's gonna work. Right. You only do these three things exactly how I want you to do, it's gonna work like a champ. Everybody has something a little different they wanna do. So therefore, your instructions aren't gonna tell you everything. The specifications, documentations, however they wanna put it in, is not gonna cover everything that you're wanting to do. And not every API does the same things. I, I take this as an example. UPS, FedEx, DHL, those are your three main small pack. Each one of their APIs does something different. So you can't make your software perform the same for all three of them. DHL doesn't have as many services. So it chooses the service for you. FedEx, I can track by packages and I can put it in a thousand different ways. UPS tracks by um, 
tracks only by the tracking number, not by package, by tracking number in their API. So therefore, if you have multiple packages with the same tracking number, they can get separated and you're not gonna know it. So, and generally you have different tracking numbers for each box, but not everybody does it that way. Um, so each API does something a little different and their documentation doesn't always say what they can't do. The documentation is written to tell you what they can do. The trouble is, is when you find out what they can't do that you thought they could do. So, so how do you kind of, how do you combat that, especially in the documentation uh, and finding out what you can't? Because when you usually find out what can't work, you're kind of in the middle of, I was making sure it wasn't muted. Uh, I'm having fun here recording from home. Um, but yeah, you usually find out something can't work. You're kind of, it's in a, bad situation right the worst time to figure out it you can't work is when you're like crap what do you mean this doesn't work do you use a sandbox or how do you test out the documentation and learn the can'ts of something uh because everyone knows it, like it's always fun to like test things out but like there's a difference between actual real world use and when you're in the testing environment what what's a shipper to do what how do they kind of get to reading between the lines is it just experience helps or what uh, and this leads us right into number four here, bad data. You go with the bad data. You test the bad data. You're going to get bad data all the time. No matter how good you are at going in between, you're going to get the bad data. So how you get around the documentation that doesn't tell you what it can't do is you're testing. You're testing with bad data. You're testing with good data. You're testing every scenario you can think of how you want to use the product. I guarantee you almost every time you're going to find one to two problems in the testing that you thought it could do, but it can't because not every API is made the same. Not every API has the same functionality. And you think that, Oh, it's an API. It'll do this. It'll do this. It's a magical push button thing. No, it has to be programmed to do each thing on the back end. And it'll only take what the documentation says it can do and usually it'll do a little more than documentation says because the documentation was written four years ago when it was first done and nobody's updated it since. And then there are things that are not mentioned in the documentation that you thought it could do. And when you try to use it, it doesn't. So testing, testing, testing. That's how you find out the problems with the documentation. Okay. So then I guess kind of going to that point number four of bad data leads to hours of troubleshooting or bad. Yeah. Bad data can lead to hours of troubleshooting. What is this? What do you, what do you mean by this? What, where is that kind of trip up occurring? Uh, the trip up we have is we use, uh, I'll use P44 for example, same API. We're using Mercury gate to P44, same API going through. When we send a load for echo, it asks for an NMFC. We don't send an NMFC because it doesn't matter with our shippers what the NMFC, NMFC code is. All these crazy acronyms. And so we don't send it. Therefore, we can't book with Echo. So we've got to go back and find out what the API and make up and saying, hey, anytime we book with Echo, now we have to put in a fake NMFC or find out what it is for each individual shipment we're going to send with them to be able to book with it. Bad data is going to happen. You're giving bad data when you're making up an NMFC code to them. All right. Can't handle it. Now, the other one is this. When you're – I go to this one. We had a customer just not two weeks ago. Gave a zip code for Massachusetts. Gave a state of California. In their data coming to us electronically. Right. Somebody punched it in. Wrong. Bad data happens. Do you have a way of finding out what that bad data is? Do you have some way to throw up an error that makes sense? I have the worst time. I, I remember back in the, uh, the, the late nineties, early two thousands when I had Java errors. If anybody's ever tried to read a Java error, it basically says we broke and then gives you this big old long string of stuff that means nothing. And at the very end, it happens. You know, it, it doesn't make any sense. Right. Do you have error codes when bad data comes in that tell you what it is? You need to know that about API. What do the errors mean? Because that's important. One of the things I know about with the, the Mercury Gate and the P44 thing is they will give you the first error when you try to book it. 
must have an e, a valid email address. Right. The next four times I try to book it after I fix the email address, if something else is wrong and it fails, I don't get the email, I don't get the error back. I have to ask for a P44 to do it. And it's not a P44 problem. It's a Mercury Gate P44 integration behind the scenes that's a problem. Mercury Gate gets the first one, puts it in there, and will not return another error for eight hours. So if I tried eight hours later, I get another one. Those are the kind of things that are not in documentation that bad data pulls up. If you don't have a good enough error system to show you everything that's wrong the first time, you need to, you need to know it. Bad data is going to happen. Right. So you can't, you're not avoiding bad data. And that's one of the things that they think is like, oh, no, I got good data. I don't have fat fingers. I never mess up anything. Bad data happens. It's more of how do you catch the bad data? That is the misconception. Uh, it's going to happen no matter what. Mm -hmm. Wow. This is, this is fun. Because uh, you would sit there and think like, I don't want bad data. Like, I'd be afraid of it. But like, there is value to it if you can have the systems in place to be able to capture that. How do they set up the error catching system? Uh, every, like I said, every API is different. Everybody has different errors. Back when I was doing programming, um, my brother used to give me such a hard time. Every time you have a call, you need to have an error trap. So I learned to do an error trap. I'm kind of lazy coding. So about every three or four, when I think it would mess up. <laughs> the biggest thing is, is at the end of that documentation, way down at the bottom that nobody ever gets to because everybody's tired of reading before they get to it is a list of error codes in your testing you need to make sure those error codes come up for some reason so that you can understand what they mean oh okay all right when it says i don't i the the email address is invalid it's because it's not because it's an invalid email address. It's because there's three email addresses and they're separated by colons instead of semicolons or commas and that's what they don't like for the API. That's that's how little and picky programming can be. Right. But it, it oh wow, okay. So it all kind of blends together. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh let's hit the last one then. Let's let's wrap it all up. And I think this is something you sort of touched on a little bit earlier, but in terms of that fifth way shippers get tripped up when setting up an API connection with a carrier, set and forget it's a myth. It's no. not going to happen. If you were completely robotic, nobody touched the keyboard, nobody touched the data, nobody had anything to do with it, you wouldn't be able to ship anything anyway, right? Right. So somebody's touching it, somebody's doing it, somebody put it in wrong. It might even have been six years ago, but you hadn't shipped this 27 pack of the product where something was misspelled. You're always shipping the 12 pack or the 24 pack, not the 27. So in the 27, they have something in it wrong trying to find that they come up all the time silly little errors um one of the things that really comes up and it came up really bad about 10 to 12 years ago was they put new zip codes out in the midwest for the 911 system so your address that was good two months ago now doesn't work because oh. they have new zip codes for the 911 operators to be able to find stuff um, and, and you don't really think about that as a coder and you're a coder. You're just a geek. You know how your, how your computer works. You don't know that over there in, in Kansas, they're redoing their entire zip coding system right now so that six months from now, everything you know is different. Set it and forget it never works because somebody's always changing something. <laughs> right. Um, another one of the things I think about is when I send a carrier A, I have to have a zip code and a state and all the information when I send it to carrier B, I just need to have an address because all they deal with is right here in this little tiny town. Okay, that's where they deliver to last leg, whatever it may be. So they don't need as much information as good. So I've been shipping with them for years. Well, a hurricane came and they're out of they're out of uh, commission for a couple of weeks. I need to use another carrier. I use the same data to tender to another carrier that I used for this guy for the last 10 years. He needs more data. He catches something wrong. Things change. Things are different. Set it and forget it. Nothing works forever. There's always something to touch. So you think you've got it. You think you've got it just right. Just perfect. Everything's running smooth. That's when you know you're in trouble. Because something's going to blindside you.
<laughs> you got to be pessimistic to be in the, the data world, huh? <laughs> yeah. All right, so then what do they do? Because, uh, I mean, you're not hired for that, right? If you're a shipper, you just want to set up the API connection, you want to be able to send the stuff. How do you manage that? How do you kind of, if you can't set it and forget it, which is the big thing everyone wants, automation, automation, automation. What do you do? How do you kind of have it where this technology is a resource to you? It's not a hindrance or a new job function. You're like, when did I sign up for this? This is not something that you can have your IT professional, the, your IT professional from down the street, you know, your your grandson. You tell me I can't your, get Geek Squad on this? <laughs> yeah. Geek Squad is not going to help you with API connections. Okay? Well, what am I going to Best Buy for? <laughs> They're great at fixing PCs, finding viruses, cleaning up computers for people who really just can't use them. But when you're looking at API, you've got to hire that guy. You, if you're looking at EDI, API, connections to other people and different softwares come together, you need to have that guy or that team even because the guy gets kind of tired after a while. There's no sleeping and what's digitized everything. You need to have that guy. You need to have that guy who can dig in there and understand whether it's JSON, HTML, XML, EDI, what number of EDI it is. You've got to have this person who understands what it is. Because if you don't, you're going to be spending a ton of money to get the company who's doing it. Um, one of the things we ran into um, with, the, with the Mercury Gate P44 connection, because there are now two companies involved in this, okay? All right. So we're paying both companies to look at the problem going at each other. So you're paying double the rate. So you get a guy like me who is who can understand exactly where it's breaking. And instead of having to ask both of them to look at it, I know who's breaking it. And I can go to that company and say, hey, this is where we're messing up. What do we need to do different or what do you need to change? You've got to have that person who understands it because it's never a set it and forget it. This is not Ronco, people. This is data. Data happens. Okay. <laughs> to be as clearly clearly nice clean as I can be data happens because you know what I want to say <laughs> yes we're all aware <laughs> it happens a lot and <laughs> you know it, people mess up we're humans we're air that's why we have such great comedy is because we keep screwing up and in the data world when a little thing screws up if you don't know where to look you can spend exponentially longer to find it if you've never run into it before. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. What, what about um, hiring out? I know that it's, it's we, we do full managed service, uh, full freight managed solutions and stuff like that. You're at integration. How important is it to have that person on staff or is this something that like, maybe it is depending on the kind of the mode you're shipping or how much you're shipping, you don't need to technically have someone on staff for you. Is that like a possible or kind of where, where do they run into that? No, a lot of our customers use Klein Schmidt. Okay. Klein Schmidt is a great third party who does um, integrations. So they transfer from your CSV file because that's all you can spit out in your warehouse management system. And they transfer it into EDI or XML or JSON so they can be put into somebody else's system. Um, so a, a company like Kleinsmith, you're looking for a data integration company. And yeah, Kleinsmith is the largest in the world right now. They do, they do a really good job. They're really intelligent and they, they do it very well for your, for you. I do it for each of our customers and, and I understand it. And I use a tool called Boomi so that I can do it easier, faster and have better Error, error catching. Remember that error catching? So I can understand the errors that are coming through. It's very important. You can use Kleinschmidt. You can hire that guy or that team, whether that team would be um, a third party or whether it be somebody on your staff. But you've got to have somebody that you can call and talk to and figure out. And you've also got to have good documentation on your side of what each error means. It's very important because when you get an error message back from a programmer, it makes a lot of sense to them. I refer back to those Java. My brother could read Java errors all day and tell me exactly what was wrong. I kept looking at them and all I saw was Greek. Okay. Right. So you need to be able to say, when this comes up on the screen, this error means this in English. Not in Java, not in COBOL, not in C, 
not in Klein Schmidt, not in Aborn. It means this to me. I need to change the address. I have the wrong zip code. Um, uh, my email address is incorrectly formatted. That's the kind of thing you need to know in plain English, the error, what the errors mean to you. It's awesome. Makes tons of sense, Phil. Uh, again, the five ways people get tripped up, the five ways shippers get tripped up when setting up an API connection are, number one, there's always multiple connections with API. Number two, the transfer of information is always a factor. Number three, documentation never covers all the problems. Number four, bad data leads to hours of troubleshooting. And number five, for set it and forget it, it's a myth. So Bill, we'll have to come on. We'll have to do this for EDI next. <laughs> An even funner oh. one, right? <laughs> yeah, it's huge. Uh, how, if uh, folks want to get in touch with you, if they have some API connections, what's the best way to reach out to you? Uh, WVs at amorningco.com. Uh, and then I'll reply to your email and you have my cell phone number. So, yeah. Awesome. So we can talk it through. Uh, it's Man. fun stuff to people like me who are geeks. It's horrible torture for those who are not geeks. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you make it simple. I mean, like you said, right? Like you help break down that language thing because you hear standard, you're like, oh, it makes all the sense. But you broke it down in a way that I understood finally where the difference between standard really is. So I think you're a fun one to talk to. Uh, LinkedIn's another great location for you. So I'll make sure I throw all those links on uh, the show notes. But otherwise, Bill, thanks for joining today. No problem. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. See ya. See you, man. And that's our show. Have something that tripped you up when you were setting up an API connection with a carrier? Let us know in the comment section. In the meantime, subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching Consulting Logistics. I'm Kyle McNaught. Rock and roll.